I suspect, like many of you, I've really enjoyed listening to the first two presentations by Fred and by John. I was impressed by, I think uh, John said, their decades of experience, uh, their fluency with which they spoke, and it has to be said, some pretty nifty graphics as well. Uh, I have none of those things. <laughs> and you may actually wonder, well, in fact, well, why am I up here? Um, and I think, in part, it relates to two things, one of which is Peter alluded to in his opening remarks. Uh, I do a lot of Im impact work at IFPRI, evaluating what other people do. And I've also been at the Institute for a number of years, and at various points in time, I've actually been quite critical about the way in which IFPRI has thought about influence and policy processes. And I suspect it may actually be the latter, which has actually led me to this particular spot. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer uh, what could be loosely described as some structured uh, stream of consciousness thoughts on the issue of challenges, methods, and innovations, noting that both Fred and John, I think, have talked very, uh, in a great deal of depth about the evidence-based policy making and how we thought about that, and have also referred to methods and issues as I've gone along. And my starting point in this is one is to say, well, in fact, why should we be actually having this discussion at IFPRI? One reason for doing so and that Peter alluded to in his opening remarks, is basically because our donors want us to. And at one level, in the notion that as a public institution we have to be accountable, I think that's a very powerful reason for doing so. But at another level, it makes me really very uncomfortable that if this is the only reason for doing or looking at issues around policy influence, or if we give this reason primacy above all others, what we're really saying is we're doing this for the money. And to be perfectly honest, there are a number of institutions in the Washington area who will do many things for money. And one of the things which I think is long distinguished IFPRI for many of those other institutions is that we don't just chase money for its own sake. We undertake activities because we believe them to be intellectually valuable and we perceive that they're going to be ultimately of benefit to poor people in developing countries. So my first starting point is to say, well, can I actually think about this whole topic of policy influence in a way which is consistent with IFPRI's culture and its longer term objectives? The second starting point that I take on this is the notion that IFPRI as an institution does a lot of impact evaluation of other people's work. And it would be hypocritical of us if we applied a lower standard to the evaluation of our own work than we do to the evaluation of others. So I think the second point to go forward is to say, can we think of actually methods and designs when we do this work in assessing our own policy influence that we, if we are reading it as a disinterested third party, would perceive as being credible and rigorous? So thinking about these ideas, I started to think, well, what is it that we try and do? Ultimately, what is it that IFP wants to do as an institution, what we want to do as individuals? What, in some loose general sense, is the broad objective of anything to do with development? And to borrow some ideas from Amartya Sen and others, one could argue that the ultimate objective of development is the notion of the creation of sustainable agency. When we talk about agency, of course, we talk about the capability of an individual or an organization or perhaps a government to take action. And we can think of capabilities as being expanded through having greater resources, through the provision of knowledge, through the relaxation of constraints, and or the creation of opportunities. And we can think of policy influence and understanding policy influence is working through two of those, through the provision of knowledge and the relaxation of constraints, creation of opportunities. So, for example, I think of the work that IFPRI has done probably for at least for 10 years, perhaps longer, on international trade reform as it pertains to agriculture. You can see that's a very good example. We create knowledge, which enables, empowers many actors to uh, participate in a more informed way in those discussions. And we perceive under certain circumstances that in fact the relaxation of certain trade constraints will create new opportunities, for example, for smallholders in developing countries. So in that context, we can, th actually, we can actually think of policy influence, wanting to understand it and to do it better, is actually something which is actually central to what we want to do at IFPRI. 
which I would argue gives it much more legitimacy than the idea of we're just doing it to chase money. The second part, though, of this uh, idea of this insight for development, of course, is this notion of sustainability. That not only are we creating agency, but we want something which is actually going to last. And that then took me, as I was thinking about this, to what you could describe as a tale of two policy process influences that exist at IFPRI. One of which is very well known, uh, one of which is hardly known at all. The one which is very well known, at least amongst those of us who've been here for a few years, is work IFPRI did in the late 1990s in Vietnam on uh, export rice quotas. In the late 1990s, the government of Vietnam had very st strict quotas on how much rice could be exported. But they and some of external stakeholders, such as the Asian Development Bank, were not absolutely sure that this was the right policy to follow. A number of IFPRI researchers uh, spent time in Vietnam analyzing rice markets, looking at the distribution of who is affected by these quotas, and developed results that suggested that particularly smallholder farmers would benefit by the relaxation or the abolition of these quotas. And those staff members did excellent work. They worked very closely with a select uh, group of high-level policymakers, with the result that the policy was abolished. A few years later, in fact, someone went back. They actually did some uh, narrative work, the kind that you all were describing. They did some cost-benefit analysis, which suggested that, in fact, this, this policy change generated something like $75 million in extra revenues to these farmers in the first year or so in which it was operation. And if we think about this, well, this sounds like a beautiful example of policy influence. There being rigorous research, dialogue with policymakers, a change that makes people better off, kind of ticking off all those boxes. But as often is the case, with every story, there's a but. And the but goes like this, is that when the work was done assessing IFPRI's work on rice markets, it was noted that, in fact, that there wasn't a lot of capacity strengthening that went along with this. There wasn't a lot of widespread dialogue and discussion. This is really a, basically a small group of researchers working with a small set of policymakers. Go forward a number of years to 2007, 2008. As you know, world food prices start to rise during that period of time. Countries look at what they should do, how they should respond. And what does Vietnam do? They impose rice quotas. In fact, they import, imposed a ban on rice exports, which cost uh, Vietnamese farmers, probably hundreds of millions of dollars in lost revenues, and of course actually contributed to the rise in rice prices in the first part of 2008. So seeing in this way, we have a policy or policy process influence that one level looks great, but if what we really care about is sustainable policy influence, then in fact it didn't work at all. My second example which is none of the glamour and excitement of export bans and rice markets in Vietnam. Uh, Ethiopia uh, has a large-scale social safety net called the Productive Safety Nets Program, which, is, which reflects a combination of people doing food for work or cash for work, uh, the provision of agricultural services, and so on and so forth. And one of the issues that developed both for the government and the donors who fund the program in the first years or so after it was implemented is, well, when do we decide people have actually sort of achieved these objectives we have for them under this program and therefore should, should leave the program, should graduate? And the government had an idea, well, maybe we'll have an in in income benchmark, but we're not really sure how that will work. Uh, I think some donors were worried that people might be prematurely pushed off the program. And so IFPRI was asked to provide some ideas as to how, how these graduation benchmarks, as they were described, could actually be, be measured and implemented. And so we did some work both in Washington and in our office in Addis Ababa. And what we suggested is that rather than actually thinking about there being an income threshold, we think about there being an asset threshold. And we gave some ideas as to what um, uh, those asset levels could be in different parts of the country. We had some of the discussions with the uh, uh, government officials in Addis Ababa, but crucially, one of our Addis-based colleagues, Alamayo Sam Tefesi, went out to the various regions of Ethiopia where the program was being implemented and went to some deeply unglamorous places, spent a lot of time talking about this idea with regional officials, 
but also crucially with people who are at the next administrative level down. What in Ethiopia is referred to as a warda. It's like a US equivalent or a British equivalent would be like a county. And the ward officials were actually had a lot of responsibility for the implementation of these uh, benchmarks and their use. And what came out of that was a discussion that in fact probably these asset thresholds uh, probably were a useful idea, but the threshold, the numbers that were being talked about really didn't necessarily seem right to some people. So at the ward level, ward officials took these back, had a whole series of additional consultations, both amongst their own staff and subsequent staff. And at the ward level then started to build, develop their own benchmarks. Flash forward about four years, and researchers from the Institute of Development Studies were asked to do some work on graduation in the context of the Productive Safety Nets program. So they went out and asked all these people about uh, how do you actually assess when someone is ready to graduate. And what was really interesting is the following, is that people used, certainly some of the language that was in the original IFP documentation. Virtually everywhere people talked about graduation in terms of an asset threshold, but they were absolutely clear that this was their own idea. Uh, nobody had ever heard of IFPRI. So you have this interesting conundrum. My first example, export quotas, very clear that we can sort of identify the policy influence, but it's influence which actually is not sustainable and arguably was not sustained at a point in time when it mattered most. Then you have a second example, which has now been running for five years, in which say for the institutional memory, so maybe half a dozen people, there would be no way of actually take, tracing it back to IFPRI's involvement. So that throws up, I think, an issue which I know a number of you talked about, which is the issue of how do you actually come up with attribution. But the point I want to bring out to you is to say when we talk about policy influence, as I think uh, John mentioned in his presentation, there are actually a whole series of stages associated with that. And my graphic is not nearly as nice or as elegant as his. But when we talk about policy processes, we can talk about them in terms of agenda setting, in terms of formulation, in terms of implementation, and then evaluation and possibly back again. And when we think about how we should actually be thinking about influence, we should be thinking about influence across all these different stages, and not the one which people seem to focus on most of all, which is that of the implementation, picking a policy and putting it into place. And as I thought about this, I thought, well, you know, some of this is actually sounding somewhat familiar to me. And the original example, interestingly, I was going to use was actually taken very closely to, from something what John said when he talked about behavior change, which is when you talk about these policy processes for people who work in nutrition, they actually think about it in a very similar way when they think about it, uh, introducing new ideas, uh, new methods of actually preventing, uh, for example, stunting in children under two. And they talk about it in terms of behavior communication and change. But you could also talk about it in lots of other ways, and if we being you know, an institution which pays a lot of attention to agriculture. Well, I thought you could also think about this in terms of how we actually introduce new agricultural technologies. And if you want to stretch the idea a bit, when you talk about the introduction of research into policy processes, you're talking about innovations or changes, which in some ways is an analogous to the way we think about the introduction of new technologies in other spheres as well. When we talk about new agricultural technologies, a very early stage, of course, has to do with problem identification, which is analogous to agenda setting. There's the issue of formulation. For example, the development and dissemination of new crops or new techniques is very much along the lines of talking about uh, developing options, talking about them with policymakers. Implementation is like adoption by farmers, and so on and so forth. And one useful feature of this beyond the fact it seemed to be a really neat analogy that I wanted to work into the presentation, was this idea that, in fact, we actually have a whole suite of techniques that we use when we actually think about evaluating the introduction of new technologies. And they may offer possibilities in terms of methods we can use in terms of assessing policy influence. So what this tells me, in terms of my kind of stream of consciousness, is the first, is several things. One of which is when we talk about assessing policy influence, we should really be talking about it at all stages of the policy process, and not just at the point of policy, of policy implementation. And arguably, if you think this point about sustainability is an important one, policy implementation is that maybe is the least important stage over which influence should be assessed. Second, that seeing an analogy between policy processes and technology adoption opens up a set of actions over which policy engagement occurs and also thus can be assessed. 
We can think about these in terms of what outcomes do relevant actors seek to achieve. We can think about measurement. Is it the case that what we are interested in is whether or not a policy is, um, so the example I have here is that you'll say you've got a policies as they relate to nutrition. For example, we can measure effort that's, um, sorry, just as we measure intensity of adoption in the context of new agricultural technologies, we can assess dimensions relating to intensity of effort by which certain policies or ideas are being implemented or being used. We can also, of course, look at the outcomes themselves. As both John and Fred have alluded to, is that we can think about actually looking at information flows, such as the network uh, mapping that you all described. We can think of the roles of networks, as I think Fred described it in a slightly different way. We can think of the roles which are being played in terms of people's cognitive biases, the reference points, the weight of history and how that assess affects the way in which they're amenable or open to various policy and to influences on policy. It's also the case that we can, I think, then expand our toolbox of methods that we use uh, for assessing policy influence. I think the narrative techniques and the qualitative techniques that Fred and John have discussed uh, are going to be clearly very valuable, but I also think we can actually push these further. For example, in Fred's presentation, he made, made this comment that you can think of research itself as a form of intervention. And separately, he mentioned in his presentation, well, one of the things you can do as researchers, or perhaps as collection, collectivities of researchers, such as policy institutes, is you actually have some control over communications. So taking those ideas together, it would suggest that there may be contexts where, for example, we could divide some, design something like a randomized trial where we actually take different forms or sets of communications, different methods of communicating, and actually randomly allocate them across the space of policymakers. And the idea I have in particular is a number of countries in which IFP works are countries which are federal systems, where decision making is decentralized to regions or provinces, or sometimes below that, to wards or districts. And that opens a lot of scope, where in fact across these range uh, these decentralized units, is we provide different forms of communication to randomly assigned different types. Uh, sorry, we take, uh, let's say, at the level of um, district officials, we design a series of communication techniques or methods regarding a particular topic, and we randomize how those are allocated or uh, given out to these different policymakers. And that is a mechanism that allows us to do two things, one of which is it allows a sense of attribution that we know, in fact, when, for example, a message is given more intensively, for example, than less intensively, does that have some influence on these various parts of the policy process? And also, in fact, because it then informs our own work about how best we can communicate uh, ideas to policymakers in the future. Thank you very much.